Okay, for our next presentation, I'd like to introduce our uh, four presenters. Uh, Robert F. Darden is Professor of Journalism, PR, and New Media at Baylor University. He is the author of two dozen books, most recently, People Get Ready, A New History of Black Gospel Music, published by Continuum and Bloomsbury, 2005, Nothing But Love and God's Water, Volume 1, Black Sacred Music from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement, uh, published by Penn State University, 2014, and Nothing But Love and God's Water, Volume 2, uh, Black Sacred Music from Sit-In to Resurrection City, also released or published by Penn State, Uni Penn State University Press 2016. Uh, Dar Darden is the co-founder of the Black Music or the Black Gospel Music Restoration Project. Daryl Sturr is the Assistant Director of Digital Projects for Baylor University. Daryl manages the project, including budget, student assistant staffing, digital preservation processes, and, te and technology for storage, preservation, and access. Eric Ames is curator of digital collections for Baylor University. Eric performs original cataloging of items ingested into the access system, oversees outreach materials and programming, and serves as a point of contact for lenders and donors to the collection. Stephen Bolick is the audio video digitization coordinator for Baylor University. He manages the preservation transfer and digitization portion of the project and is responsible for maintaining and expanding the AV digitization studios. And the title of their presentation is the Black Gospel Music Restoration Project. So please welcome Robert, Daryl, Eric, and Stephen. Greetings, I'm so delighted to be here. We're gonna talk about something that we think turned out to be pretty remarkable, although if you come from a private Baptist university like we do, sometimes we think of it in terms of miraculous. And if you'll indulge me, I'd like to talk this, start this with just a, a few personal comments because from sometimes the tiniest seeds, great things do indeed grow. I was a military brat, and I grew up in the United States Air Force when it was formed as an integrated instrument of the federal government, and my friends are black, and I was in and out of their houses, and that was the music they played to the point where this music, black sacred music, became the soundtrack of my life, and it has never left me. I became the first gospel music editor for Billboard magazine in New York for 15 <laughs> years, and worked as a newspaper reporter after that, and eventually a freelance writer. And it was only when I actually became to Baylor University that I got to write about my passion on a larger scale. And that was where People Get Ready, A New History of Black Gospel Music came from. But in the course of researching People Get Ready, I would write about a song that had been a transformational song in American history, a song that changed lives, part of the civil rights movement, or influenced rock and roll, and I couldn't hear it. I couldn't find it. In the days, early days of eBay and Amazon, it didn't exist. And at the end of the book, which did very well and is still in print and still being used in colleges, I was more angry than I was happy because most of the music that I've been writing about, I could not hear. So I called a number of collectors and we came up with a figure that 75% of the black sacred music released during the so-called golden age of gospel music, say 1945, 1970, 1975, is simply lost, unavailable, in landfills, tied up in litigation, hidden away under layers of corporate mistrust, distrust, and gone. And in my arrogance, I sat down and wrote an editorial and sent it to the New York By God Times, which receives 800 editorial submissions a week. And on February 15, 2005, they ran it. And essentially what it said is, this music, this foundational music of American popular music, should we allow this music to disappear, which is apparently what we're doing, future generations are going to be very, very harsh on us. 
And I used a word that isn't often used in the New York Times. I said, future generations will consider this a sin. And that editorial was read, as New York Times editorials often are, widely. And a gentleman in New York, a Mr. Charles Royce, who is an investment banker, called the next day and said, I don't know anything about you, and I sure don't know anything about music. I'm Episcopalian. And what I would like to do is you figure out how to save this, and I'll pay for it. So I did what all smart academics do. I went to the libraries. Now, libraries in the academic world, for you guys who are outside of that, ac libraries are like Switzerland. We're the only guy, the libraries are the only guys who get along with everybody else. And they try to help everybody. And I trusted librarians. So I met with the interim dean, the head of IT, Tim Logan, and Daryl Sturr, who's on this panel today. And that was nearly 11 years ago. And I said, guys, this man says he'll pay for us trying to save gospel music. Will you, can you help me? And why I love working with librarians is they always say, can do. And so, didn't even know where to begin. So Mr. Roy said, well, go find somebody that's doing it and use that as a pattern. So I called Chris Stratwitz. God bless him. I saw him at a record store yesterday. Chris, are you here? Yeah. Hey, thank you, God. You saw us sight unseen. I called Lance Ledbetter at Dusta Digital to go with me out to protect me from all the heathens at Berkeley. <laughs> and we went out and spent three days with... Chris and Tom Diamante, and they had a very small thing going for what would become the Frontera collection of Mexican-American music with UCLA. And I drew very crude schematics and drotted down some ideas and came back and met with the librarians and turned it over to Daryl. I hope you still have that sketch somewhere. And they went off and months and months later came back with what would become the Black Gospel Music Restoration Project, saying, if he's going to pay for it, let's do it right. So they went out and found the very best equipment that they could find in the whole world. We figured we needed a couple years for audio engineers and cataloging. We sent that to Mr. Royce and he sent by a return mail a check for $350,000. So I retired from development at that point, knowing that I was never going to beat that particular time. And that for where it began. And word got around fast, and I think some of it was kind of the word people thinking how odd this is that a particularly white Baptist University in Waco, Texas would want to be the center for preservation of black sacred music. And the disc started coming in. There were people going up in their attic. There were people who were finding out about us and sending us records that they had bought. And people like Bob Maravich, who's here, I hope Bob, down in front. Bob, who's one of the, perhaps the largest collector of gospel music in America, very graciously said he would loan us his collection. And we've been digitizing it now for nine years, and we're still not halfway through his 45s. God bless you, Bob, for saving this extraordinary music when nobody else cared. And as the music came in, the word got out, and we were on Fresh Air with Terry Gross, and in the New York Times, and on the BBC, and nearly every NPR station. And that meant more music came in. And very early, we began to see something. That on the flip sides of the 45s, there were very aggressive civil rights-related songs. At a time when singing one of these songs would get you hung up in Alabama or Mississippi, we were singing the flip side songs that were saying, there ain't no segregation in heaven. And I believe Martin Luther King is right. And in a rare moment of inspiration, I made a connection to the old spirituals, the protest spirituals, where they sang songs of freedom and hope and justice right under the faces and noses of the overseers. And I saw that these songs were part of this almost apostolic connection. And it set me off on a 10-year journey to write what would become the two books. I'm sorry, I've already screwed it up, guys. Oh, I got it. I can play that song. I'm the face of the place. I don't do, they don't let me touch any of the toys. <laughs> Here's a freedom song for all your freedom fighters out there everywhere. And when you sing, remember the wonderful ones who lost their dedicated lives for this precious purpose and won't be around to see it through. Now sing, sing, every one of you. <laughs> 
particular song, again, from Bob Maravich and many others, uh, set us on a journey that took me to Nothing But Love in God's Water, where we went and interviewed 150 survivors of the movement. It seems that there's entire libraries of the civil rights movement, but no one had talked about to the people about the songs they sang and where and when and why and how they helped change the world. And this story will get picked up again, but before you get there, you have to get to the actual project itself and how it was put together. And for that, I'll let the guys who actually do the work take it from here. Hello. So um, I'm going to just take you through the workflow, the digitization process uh, for this project. Um, these are the steps that we do. Probably will seem familiar to most people. We inventory them, we clean them, transfer, we edit uh, the embedded broadcast wave metadata, we insert track markers with the names, generate access files, and then uh, scan uh, all the relevant images. Uh, the first part uh, is the inventorying. and we, we track all of our projects in Google Docs spreadsheets like this. Um, and every, all the information that's on the disk or the jacket um, is inserted into these spreadsheets and then they're given ID numbers to, to keep track of them through the process. And uh, then we clean the disks, put them in new sleeves, so then they're ready for transfer. And here's a picture of our, uh, our little studio. It's a little booth. Um, we have two, you can see we have two transfer chains there. Uh, this is the, the gear that we use for that. Um, one of them is the Record Cut Rondine 3. We use it for um, microgroove and coarse groove records. And then we also have the Riga RP10, which we use just for microgroove. And the majority of the materials for this project are uh, LPs or 45s. Um, and then that's fed into um, Metric Halo LI08. That's our AD converter. Uh, for the microgroove records, we do uh, parallel transfers and we use uh, Adobe Audition for that and we um, switch back and forth between the two uh, in monitoring to make sure everything's going okay. And then we'll do a whole, a whole batch of disks and then open them up in BWF Meta Edit to edit the insert and change and the the embedded metadata, and that's uh, descriptive metadata and then also the technical metadata about the transfer. After that, we use WaveLab to insert track markers, uh, to, and this is to help us create the access files later, um, and, and the, it'll have an ID number and the song title that then that gets split and becomes the uh, the, the tracks for the access file. And then we generate an MD5 checksum for the preservation master, and then it gets copied to our preservation server. Uh, then we, we split these files to create the access files, and then run a batch process in WaveLab that ends up in an MP3. And we do a few processes there just to kind of make it a little bit more consistent uh, experience in, in our access system. There's a recap of the software we use. And then um, finally, we scan 
the discs front and back, the jackets and the sleeves and any other uh, accompanying materials that are, that are relevant. And then those are checksummed also and inserted into the preservation system, which I will hand it over to Daryl to take to do. Hi. So all the files that uh, Stephen and his assistants uh, generate throughout the day, um, they get pushed to our preservation server. Um, uh, this server is a, it's a processing st server. It, it temporarily stores files for this project and the other projects we're working on, um, as well as long-term storage um, for the Black Gospel Music Restoration Project. Uh, we use Dell servers. Um, our preservation server is a Dell connected to two Nexan uh, storage arrays. Uh, we run Red Hat. Um, we use preservation tools on the server to um, validate the incoming files. Um, we do uh, object validation and uh, verify the checksums of the files that the system receives. Um, the system also pushes to LTO5 nightly, so we get a little push to tape so we can take those files offline. And then quarterly, we take a snapshot of all of our collections uh, on LTO7 tape, and then we, uh, we take those off-site. So we're members of the Texas Digital Library, and um, we make use of DuraCloud at TDL, a service that they offer. Uh, DuraCloud is a system for managing your preservation files in the cloud. Um, it's storage agnostic, um, and so it can connect to different storage systems. Uh, Texas Digital Library offers three, uh, Amazon Glacier, Amazon S3, um, and then a local storage system. Uh, we've gone with um, uh, Amazon Glacier. Right now it's the cheapest per gigabyte. And so, um, so that's the preservation side. Um, access workflow is like this. We start with those initial spreadsheets that uh, Stephen and the assistants will generate. Um, uh, that's in Google Sheets. We will pull that data. Um, we'll use a, a Perl script or two to uh, use the IDs, pull the data, and then um, access all of the, the digital objects, everything that makes up what we call a single record in our access system. Um, and that's pushed into Content DM. And on the right is a screenshot from our, our Content DM system. Content DM is a digital asset management system uh, provided by OCLC. Um, and we use it to um, provide access to this collection and, and all of our others. And so um, ingest into the system is done with a local piece of software called the Content DM Project Client. Uh, screenshots on the left of a single record that's been ingested. Um, we use this system to do the cataloging. So all cataloging is done here. Um, the collection, uh, we use qualified Dublin, uh, Dublin Core uh, plus additional fields, so not all fields will map to Dublin Core. Um, most description comes from the jacket or the discs. Uh, sometimes we've got issues where we don't have enough information, especially with dates. Um, we actually use two date fields in order to solve that problem. Sometimes we, we may know a disc is from the 1950s. Um, and so we have one field where we can show, you know, 195X saying that it's from the 1950s. And then we use another field to kind of trick the system so that somebody searches for a disc 1956 that that disc would also, also come up. Um, we also use OpenRefine for metadata quality control. So Eric does most of the um, uh, cataloging for this collection at this point, but our metadata librarian can export the data of a single batch that we've uh, uh, uploaded, um, put that into OpenRefine. Um, and for those of you not familiar with OpenRefine, it, it looks like a spreadsheet. Um, it, it's, more, it's a little bit more powerful, functions like a script, but everything is done live. So um, metadata librarian can see things that things will kind of jump out uh, if, if they aren't matching up. Um, and uh, she uses it to normalize fields like artists. So artists are, um, is a control field, and uh, she'll use um, Library of Congress authority records to, uh, to make sure that the artist field is, is consistent. And so as part of our preservation work, what we would typically do is we would export all of the descriptive metadata in our Content DM system, and we'd run it through a program called 7Train, which California Digital Library uh, created. Um, and 7Train would take all of our data and create these really nice METS files. Um, and those METS files would live alongside of the, of the preservation data. Um, that is now obsolete. We are moving to this system now. Um, this is uh, Archivematica. Um, Archivematica is our future preservation system. Uh, we plan to uh, deploy the system in the summer and begin ingesting uh, this collection plus our 69 others, um, uh, which equate to about 42 terabytes worth of data uh, starting in the fall. 
So project stats for the Black Gospel Music Restoration Project now, um, 3.2 terabytes worth of preservation data, 11,813 image files, 11,544 tracks, um, and 119,000 uh, metadata terms at this point. So um, access is through our digital collections, which is digitalcollections.baylor.edu. Um, and to drive traffic and raise awareness uh, of the work that we're doing, I'm going to turn it over to Eric Ames, um, talk about some of our outreach efforts. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, as Bob mentioned, uh, as a group that works at uh, not only a private Baptist university, but the largest in the world, uh, you start to think of your work in terms of a calling. And I think one of the great parts about the Gospel Project is that each of us gets to work on something that fits our skill sets and our interests. This happens to be mine. Um, as you might imagine, our backgrounds uh, for people who access this collection is incredibly uh, varied. The scholars like Bob uh, Darden, Bob Maravich, uh, Horace Maxiel, Guthrie Ramsey, the people who are really into the ethnomusicology of this collection are just one. We also have the fans of the genre. We have someone who is a, uh, a pastor a long time in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, who sends us a box of 78s because he's had them forever and he's loved them, but he can no longer play them, but he wants to make sure they're preserved. Uh, we have Baylor students who a run a gamut between the people who sing this music still in their churches every day to people who've never heard it except outside of a sample in a hip hop song. And so we have to try to reach those students. And then of course the general public, people who find the collection through an interview on NPR or just a random Google search. So we've created a portal page, baylor.edu slash library slash gospel that points people toward all the different aspects of the collection. Then in addition to that, uh, we have a number of, of initiatives that we've instigated that allow us to outreach to these different publics in different ways. Uh, the first is a gospel concert that I'll talk about in depth. The second is a art exhibition driven by student artists. We have a donor recognition wall on the website where we've taken gospel labels and put people's names on them in recognition of the work that they've done to support the work of the project. We write a blog with regular content focused on the collection and then print pieces and collateral material. So I want to move through a few of those just to give you an idea of what we're trying to do to interface this collection on a broader scale. Also, if you'd like, there's a copy of the brochure available at that address at the bottom, bit.ly slash BGMRP brochure. For, absolutely. That's about the most concise and beautiful web URL I could give you for the enormous path where that actually lives. So Voices in Vinyl started in 2015, and we approached an on-campus group called the Heavenly Voices Acapella Gospel Choir, and we said, we have this large collection of gospel songs. We would love for you to take them as your inspiration and perform a concert of your own remixes of the songs from this project. And so they were very enthusiastic to take that project on. Uh, the young man in the red jacket is Christian Broussard. He is their musical director. He's in training to be a pastor. He, he performs all the time. He said, this is great. Let's do it. So around Christmas in 2015, we presented the concert with the lineup there on the left. Some of them were pretty traditional renditions. Others were more uh, modern in their uh, tone and style. But the important part was that we were able to stage this in the main lobby of our library building, and we started to draw a crowd. And so as you're walking through the library, you're expecting to study for your end of year exams, and you're hearing these reinterpretations of these gospel songs. And it really, it stopped people in their tracks, and, and was a really nice start to what I hope becomes an annual project. Fast forward to April of this year. Volume two. Uh, this time, we staged the concert right around uh, Easter, actually the Tuesday before Easter break. And I gave them more leeway this time. I said, I want you to kind of go crazy, take the songs you like, and interpret them your own way. And so they did five more songs this time around, kept it a nice tight 30 minute set. The key difference this year though was that we actually live streamed this on our Facebook page for our digital projects group. And as it got picked up by other points on campus, including the large Baylor social media, we were exposing this to 13,000 people within an hour. Um, the live stream itself was accessed over 3,000 times in 24 hours. So we know now that this has an appeal outside of just the people who you know, follow us for this particular project. This is getting picked up by folks that are alums all over the world who typically interface with totally different aspects of Baylor campus uh, than this project. But it was another great success. And we've really enjoyed working with this particular student group, so much so that we've hired Christian for this summer to come in and help us find new ways to expand. Uh, he has a lot of contacts with local churches that we hope to uh, use to our advantage to keep reaching out to local collectors and then beyond in the broader region. The second initiative was Visions of Rapture, and for this, I wanted to try to involve students from a different discipline. Um, one of the things that you find really quickly with this collection is the 45s are just that. They're the discs with no labels. And so I approached a, a professor uh, of graphic design and I said, what if we asked your students to design labels for these discs that never actually had them? Give a visual component to something that was a completely audio format. He said, great, I'll propose it as a project, the students can take it on, um, and they ran with it. So we've done it for two years now. Uh, we've given the students three songs each, picked at random. 
Um, and then they generate their art and we display them in the main library for people to see. There's also an online uh, component that we've created using the Omeka digital exhibit uh, builder. So just a few from this year's batch. I don't really limit them in terms of the artwork that they do. So some of these students are very illustration heavy, some are photographers, some are actually uh, fine artists that have moved into some graphic design. But I said just here's the format, it's seven by seven square on each side, go nuts. And so they run a, a wide gamut, I wanted to show you a few. Some would include the lyrics on the back. I said if you want to be inspired by this music, listen to it, listen to the words, and then start to draw your inspiration from there. Uh, others are a little more ethereal. Uh, this is a song called Back to the Dust, and this particular uh, student went very uh, celestial with it. Uh, lots of uh, galaxy-related imagery. For this particular one, she was stuck on a song about, uh, let me thank you for making birds that sing, and so she used a digital stylus with a, a tablet to create this original artwork of a bird landing on someone's hand that looks like an actual painted piece. And as she was working on it, all the other students kind of gathered around, and they had this moment where they watched her perform. Uh, really amazing uh, to watch. This particular student was really interested in this idea of a march being a very steady beat, and so she was looking at sound waves and watching how they bounce in a waveform, and that was her inspiration to start moving this art along this idea of a, a bouncing path. So wherever they found their inspiration with it, they, they all generated great art, and eventually it goes up on the wall in the library, and students can gather around and study near it, and it catches a lot of attention as people walk by. It was a really great opportunity for us to try to reach into a student segment that doesn't normally interface with this collection. Some lessons learned, if you can speak the student's language, you can start to motivate them. Uh, the first time around I came in, it was all about the gospel project, this gospel music is amazing, and it was fairly successful. The second time around I said, think about putting yourself in the feet of the people who made this music, who didn't have an opportunity to make this art. You are doing this for them. You're now commissioned by them to do it, and that really motivated them. These are students who want to get into professional design for a living. They're also millennials. They want tons of structure. They wanted step-by-step -step outlines for everything we asked them to do. I couldn't just say, be inspired. I had to say, be inspired, and then give me it this, and this, and this. Uh, it was very helpful for the second time around for them to have that structure. I was very upfront. I said, I'd like it to look this format, include these copyright terms, and then the rest is up to you. From the first time around, I also learned you don't use a faculty member who is in their retiring semester. Uh, it was harder to motivate him to stay on top of the students, to uh, get their stuff in on time, and gave me some panic attacks there toward the end. The second time around, it was a new lecturer who wants to make her mark, and she was much more on top of getting things ready. Um, a few other things that we've done for the project, uh, print collateral, of course, uh, is important. The first two screenshots there are the front and back of our uh, six-panel brochure that we created with our marketing group uh, in the library, drawing inspiration from the poster there in the middle of the Dixie Hummingbirds, a late 70s poster, these great three-color press, uh, red, blue, pink, yellow colors, uh, and then a, a profile view of an actual gospel singer from the Baylor Choir in the middle of a concert. So we kind of combined all these things together to, uh, to kind of sort of form a color palette for the project. That carries over into the poster on the right, uh, just a number of uh, what we think are some of the more interesting labels from the collection, along with our URL and some Baylor Library's branding. And then for the events that we go to now, uh, we got an opportunity to purchase some stand-up vertical banners uh, from Camelback uh, out of Houston to be able to flank us at a table or to put around a concert. You saw a couple of these in the background of the um, Voices and Vinyl concert from this year. So we have four different sets of those. The double black, we have the uh, profile of the singer, we have some posters from the collection, several from the late 70s, uh, all from one collector. And then the last one is a sort of fractured, fragmented look at a song that actually became a very important piece from our collection that I'm going to turn back over to Bob uh, for the wrap-up. And so the collection has continued to grow, and as we have expanded what we think we need to do with it, we've moved more into black preaching, because you can't really separate black preaching and black music. We just finished a thousand hours of audio videotape from the Reverend Clay Evans of Chicago digitizing and we're working into others. We've just gotten approval for a portable recording studio that we will take and set up in some of the great black churches of Chicago and Birmingham and work with the pastors and invite them to have their congregations bring their music and their pictures of grandma with Sam Cooke and their sheet music and we'll digitize them and scan them right on site. We're working on a, the first ever journal, academic, scholarly, heavily referee journal devoted strictly to gospel music, spirituals, and freedom song. We're trying to do everything as we believe we're called to do on this. And at Baylor, we believe if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, it'll be rewarded in a religious sense. 
And one of the things that has meant most to us is when the new National Museum of African American History and Culture called and asked us to provide the gospel music for the new museum. And there you can see a picture of me and our Dean Patty Orr, who has been one of our greatest supporters from her first day on campus, looking at the displays that they made of our music. And it has been something that the entire campus, which hadn't had a lot of good news lately, has shared with us and been part of the thing that maybe helpfully made Baylor heal during these difficult times. The song that Eric mentioned was one we found very early, again from Bob Maravich. It was free. It was thrown in with a box of other records that was Bob purchased. And most of the time the music comes in and you know, I'm teaching, I don't always get a chance to hear it. But in this particular case, the engineer had just recorded it and said, I need you to come hear this. So I crossed the parking lot and sat down in the beautiful studio with the soundproof walls and those glorious German speakers and heard this song by the mighty wonders of Aquasco, Maryland. And very quickly we realized this was a one-off vanity job, probably 25 copies, somebody paid $50. It was recorded probably one take in a church by the acoustics of it, somewhere around 1968, 1970. And when they played it for me, um, I inexplicably broke into tears. And I wasn't sure why, and it wasn't for many years that I knew why. But it became very quickly something of our mascot. We played it whenever I spoke, and I, I spoke a lot on this. And it touched other people. And I did an interview for the NPR station in Baltimore. And the DJ said, man, I, I love that song. Let me, let me put it on our website and let's talk about it. This is in our area that our airwaves reach. And maybe there's some members of the Mighty Wonders, because we had looked for years trying to track somebody down. We'd gone through census records. We had made phone calls. We had called. Aquasco is just a fly speck on the Eastern Shore. And there were members. And they had heard it, and they did remember the song, although none of them had it. And they were so touched, because if you know anything about that part of Maryland, it had been the site of some horrific atrocities during the American Civil Wars, that the Union troops had advanced to take Maryland. The slave owners there slaughtered their slaves rather than see them freed or gone over to the Union, and the blood cries out from the soil. And during the Civil Rights Movement, some terrible things happened because the New York Times and CBS News couldn't be everywhere. And yet they go into a studio, these men, six men, and they sing a song that says there's nothing but love in God's water. Get on board if you love Jesus. No hate, no anger, no recrimination. They sang because they were called to sing. Tis the old ship of Zion. Tis the old ship of Zion. Step on board, oh, me, me. There's nothing but love in God's water. Nothing but love. Nothing but love in God's water. Step on board if you want to see Jesus. Step on board if you want to see Jesus. Just step on board and follow me.
the Smithsonian asked us to send a thousand songs and album jackets to them, and they would choose among them for the display. And then they asked us to narrow it down somewhat. That seemed a bit overwhelming of the most famous, the most important, and the most beautiful, and sometimes the quirkiest. And so when Dinor and I traveled to the museum, of that thousand, they had narrowed down to just a handful. And one of them was the old ship of Zion by some nobodies that nobody had ever heard of. And when I told, and Eric and I told the members, surviving members, that their music was in the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and I said, don't you wish the guys who have gone before could have heard this? And they said, oh, Professor Darden, they heard it. Because we believe there's a cloud of witnesses with us at all time, those who have come before, and they heard it, and they were so pleased. And that's what we believe now at the Black Gospel Music Restoration Project. We're part of that, creating, saving, preserving this music for the cloud of witnesses that have gone before and all those many souls who have yet to hear it. Thank you. an event happening at 5.30, so um, if we could please keep questions to the end so we can move on to our next presentation. I apologize about that.